Lecture five of the World of Sound by Sir William Bragg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sounds of the Sea. The depths of the sea are very silent, in striking contrast to the noisiness of the land. We have seen that one great cause of the sounds heard by us who live in the open air is the movement of the winds in the deep sea there is very little movement of the water near the shore there is the flow and ebb of the tides but even that is by comparison slower and far quieter there is noise where the waves break on the shore as we should expect because of the churning of the water into foam the inhabitants of the sea are quiet in their movements fishes swim in a medium which floats them when they move they do not strike a succession of blows as land animals must do when their feet fall on the ground nor is there anything to correspond to the rapid beating of the air by the wings of birds and insects everything is in favour of a noiseless motion in a recent experiment at the zoological gardens observers were stationed round a tank into which they lowered very delicate listening instruments fish were thrown in by a keeper and diving birds went in after them not a sound was audible as the birds darted about underneath the water except when one or two very small air bubbles carried down by the feathers of one of the birds came to the surface and burst the only really exciting noise was made when a penguin mistook the listening apparatus for something to eat and bit hard and fishes must certainly make less noise if possible than diving birds even when an animal dives from the air into the water it is practically noiseless we have seen that a very clean metal ball dropped into water goes in almost without a sound and mr worthington's photographs have shown us that in that case the water laps quickly round the ball as it enters leaving no air bubble to make a sound by subsequent bursting noise is made when for some reason or other bubbles are formed as when the entry of the ball is so rapid that the water cannot close round it quickly enough an effect which occurs much more easily when the ball is wet or dirty or rough when an animal dives into the water it leaves no air cavity to make a noise it is quite different when we throw a big stone into the water for we then hear a hollow sounding noise a moment after it has struck we have seen that when a stream of air or water flows past an obstacle there is a constant forming of little whirlpools which in the case of the air may be so frequent that they cause a note that we can hear we do not often find the corresponding effect in water we may get vibrations as when the fishing line with a sinker on it trembles in our fingers but they are slow on the other hand there is another way in which sounds may be made in the water which is very striking the effect occurs whenever a body is moved so quickly through the water that it leaves a cavity behind it which the water from the sides has not time to fill up as fast as the body makes it it is not filled with air because the cavity is entirely under water the rapidly revolving screw of a steamer often makes cavities of this kind their chief characteristic is that when they are fully closed up again by the water crowding in from all round there is no cushion of air to break the force of the blow when the sides meet each other the blow has all the suddenness of an explosion a sharp impulse given to the water in this way travels well and far and is as we shall see later the basis of the noise made by moving steamships the effect is well known to naval engineers because it often has a destructive effect on ship propellers the blows are as violent as if they had been struck by hammers now a fish moves very quickly through the water how does it avoid this effect there is a second important question relating to the motion of a fish which can be answered at the same time as the first even if the rate at which a body is drawn through the water is not enough to cause cavitation 
there is the possibility of whirls being formed and a backwater in which whirling is taking place so that the body leaves behind it a mass of moving water which has robbed it of some of its own energy if a body can be driven through the water without leaving cavities or whirls then unnecessary energy will not be spent in driving it a fish moves with extremely little fuss even when it is travelling fast how does it do it this particular question has been very greatly studied during the war by the navy on the one hand because ships torpedoes submarines and other things are driven through the water partly or wholly submerged at far greater speeds than used to be the case and by the air service because the question is of the highest importance to the aeroplane everything it is found turns on giving the body the right shape a shape which after all is much the shape of a fish somewhat blunt in front it may be but the tail must be tapering the reason is simply that provision must be made for the quiet closing in of the water or air in the rear of the object that is going through it it is far more important to do that than to arrange for a gradual opening out in front one would naturally think that the most important thing is to have a knife-like or pointed front which cuts the water sharply but it is not so figure sixty seven turbulent motion behind bodies travelling left to right in a liquid the shape c makes least disturbance a is not quite so good b which is a reversed is very bad readers note a shows a very blunt front and a slightly tapered rear b shows a tapered front and a very blunt rear c shows a relatively blunt front and a very tapered rear End of reader's note. the fish has the right shape for moving through the water without noise and without unnecessary effort if animals that move under water can do so with such little noise it is to be expected that they cannot or do not listen for sounds animals need to know what is going on round about them and especially what other animals are doing but if these doings take place without noise it is not to be expected that listening for them will be practised we shall see later that sound travels in water very well indeed so that if there is not much listening in the sea as we understand it the fault does not lie in the sound carrying properties of the water those who have studied the development of living things tell us that at an early stage in the history of the world animals that lived in the sea and were the ancestors of the vertebrates which now live on land and in the air developed a pair of pits in the skin on the two sides of the head footnote i am indebted to professor elliot smith for much of what follows End footnote. the linings of these pits were protected by their sunk position and were more highly sensitive than other parts of the body to outside effects such as the flow of water or any change in pressure these pits were not at first organs of hearing they were very far indeed from the refined and delicate ears of land animals that came afterwards but they were able to detect the changes of pressure produced by the fish's own movements it is to be remembered that though a fish does not produce vibration rapid enough to cause sound yet it cannot move without causing the water to move also and when water moves the pressure in it is not the same all over but changes from place to place and from time to time there will be special changes of pressure when the fish swims by a rock or when it is passed by another fish the sensitive pits could be used to give information when practice had developed the power of interpreting the pressure changes to which they were sensitive the use of these organs was developed in two different directions in the first place they were used by the fish to regulate its own changes of position and in doing so took finally no doubt after long ages of development the form shown in the figure 
figure sixty eight general type of fishes ear the three semicircular canals marked c are used by the fish in maintaining its equilibrium the fish has no cochlea here there are three canals put curiously together each of them contains liquid which is set into relative motion whenever a sudden turn is made if the turn is made in the plane of the canal that contains it suppose that we had a vessel lined with long fur and filled it with water and that we then turned the vessel round quickly the water inside would for the moment stay still and all the hairs which had been sticking straight out from the side towards the centre would now be brushed flat against the moving vessel just so when this canal system is turned round suddenly the liquid in some one or more of the canals stands still while the canal goes round and certain hairs inside the canals are bent by the relative movement it is supposed that these hairs are sensitive and can report to the brain that the liquid has moved past them or rather they past the liquid and that therefore a turning movement has been made we all still have and use these canals and depend on them for knowledge of our position and our movements it is they that are affected by a too rapid turning motion as when we spin round too much and feel giddy the fish's rudimentary ears were also sensitive to pressure and to impulses from outside and it is supposed were used to detect them there were also it appears other organs running down the side of the fish which were used for the same purpose there came a time in the history of the world when certain fish-like animals no longer lived wholly under water but became amphibious they lived two lives one in the air and one in the water it appears that the rudimentary ear had become so sensitive to changes of pressure that it could be used in the air although these changes in the air were so very different in character air is a thousand times lighter than water and is very yielding water is comparatively unyielding but we know that the organs of hearing must have been useful to some extent because further progress took place and the ear became what it is now if they had been useless they would have atrophied or ceased to work the great addition was that of the cochlea the very delicate and complicated mechanism which is found in all animals whose sense of hearing is strongly developed figure sixty nine on the left the human ear showing the outer ear and in the inner ear the hammer the anvil the semicircular canals the cochlea the drum and the stirrup on the right a more detailed drawing of part of the ear showing the canals and the spiral cochlea there is no clear understanding as to how the cochlea acts we know only that it is essential to the more highly developed of the animals that live in the air although fishes have a less developed organ of hearing it does not follow that fishes do not hear at all it is fairly certain in fact that some fishes do respond to sound or at any rate they are sensitive to shocks which go with sound or are the cause of sound when we throw a stone into the brook we see the trout scatter they must have felt the shock when the stone hit the water for we know from other experiences that a shock runs extremely well through the water and must have gone through the whole body of the fish that swims in the water the sound of the air cavity left by the stone which is the principal thing we hear when we stand on the bank may or may not have been perceived by the fish the more developed the cochlea is the more perfect is the hearing and the more we find that the animal relies on its ears the crocodile for example is obliged to depend greatly on its sense of hearing because it has not much chance of using its sense of smell and when it is on land it is so near the ground that its range of view is very limited so its sense of hearing is very acute its cochlea is much better developed than in the case of lizards or snakes in birds the sense of hearing is very highly developed 
and also in mammals especially such mammals as bats and flying foxes seals and apes and man the silence of the sea no doubt goes with the fact that fishes do not make much if any use of hearing as we land animals understand it let us follow the development of the ear and see what extraordinary things it can now do we shall find that it will help us to understand some of the things i wish to speak about in the last lecture which concern the use of sound in war in the first place it is very remarkable that the ear should be able to adjust itself to very different intensities of sound the same ear that can listen in the stillness of the night to a watch ticking quietly in the room can stand within a few yards of a whistling locomotive and not be ruined instrument makers know very well how difficult it is to make instruments of any kind with a hundredth of such a range of course the ear cannot be sensitive to these extremely different sounds at the same moment whether we can or cannot hear a sound depends very greatly indeed on how much other sound is being made at the same time we all know how hard it is to talk to one another in a busy street when there is a very feeble noise that we wish to hear such as the sound of a submarine under water we may easily find instruments which magnify sound but they are of no use at all if they magnify all other sounds at the same time it is very striking nevertheless how well the ear can in many cases hear and listen to a weak sound although there is a background of much louder noise in a workroom filled with the roar and clatter of machinery the ear can pick out a human voice when its intensity is but a minute fraction of the general deluge of sound a wireless operator can listen to one set of signals coming in over his instrument and ignore others arriving at the same time we observe that in each of these cases the sound to be distinguished has something for the ear and brain to catch hold of something that distinguishes it from the distracting background the signals to which the operator is listening are spelling out a connected message and the fact links them together in the operator's mind given this to build on his power of concentration on the one set of signals can be greatly improved by practice sometimes during his course of training he is made to listen and record very feeble signals while a noisy gramophone is pounding out a catching tune in the other case there is a certain quality which distinguishes the human voice from the noise of the machinery the character and the cadence of the two sounds are quite different all our lives we have practised ourselves in making the most of the special quality of the human voice because it is to us one of the most important sounds in the whole world what is this quality which distinguishes one sound from another and on which we build so much clearly we must examine carefully a property of sound without which sound would be of little use to us in order to understand this extremely important point let us begin with a simple case if i pluck the string of the monochord in different places the pitch of the note is always the same but there is a certain difference in the sound the general character of it is not the same there is we say a difference in quality our ears have surely detected some sort of effect we can soon convince ourselves of the way in which it arises if i pluck the string at a figure seventy and we listen very carefully we find that not only the fundamental note of the string is sounding but the octave as well there are two notes sounding at once to make this easier to observe i touch the string gently in the center after plucking at a with the effect of destroying more or less the fundamental note and now the octave is clearly heard it is surprising how strong it is and we wonder how we could have passed it over before in fact if we once more pluck at a and listen to the full sound we can now hear both notes well enough but now i pluck the string at the centre 
the octave is no longer there. Figure 70. If the string is plucked first at A and then at B, the pitch of the two notes is the same, but the quality is different. But now I pluck the string at the centre, the octave is no longer there. When I try to damp the fundamental note by touching gently at the centre as I did before, all the sound ceases. So we have learnt that while the fundamental note is there no matter where I pluck the string, the octave is present when I pluck at A, and absent when I pluck in the centre. Here is a possible explanation of why the quality of the sound differs in the two cases. The octave is given by the string vibrating in two equal parts, with a point of rest at the centre. And we notice that when I pluck at the centre, and would make the centre part of the string vibrate, I do not call into existence the octave for which the centre has to be at rest. Following on this, we may anticipate that if I pluck the string at the centre, a vibration of the string in three equal parts may be called into action, and this is found to be the case. The note is well heard if I damp the fundamental note by touching the string gently at one of the points of division of the string into three equal parts and if I pluck the string at one of these points, there is no vestige of this note in the sound of the string. We learn two things. The first, that the same string may give off several different overtones of the fundamental note, this we found before, and that more than one can be sounded at the same time. Secondly, we find that we can call up different overtones in different strengths, by plucking the string in different places, although we always call up at the same time the same fundamental note. We can, in fact, account for the differences of quality of the string. We find exactly the same effect in every kind of sound-producing mechanism. We can take a further illustration from the famous old experiment of the Kladni plates. Here is a square brass plate held at its centre and mounted on a stand. When the bow is drawn across the edge of the plate at different points, the note varies very much with the position of the point, and can be made to vary still more by touching the plate at different places with the fingers. Cloudney showed how to make clear what happens in the different cases. We scatter a little sand over the plate, touch it at two points as in the figure, and draw the bow across the edge. The sand instantly gathers itself into lines and makes a pattern on the plate. We touch at two other points and again draw the bow across. The old pattern disappears and a new one takes its place. The explanation is simply that the plate vibrates in separate portions just as the string vibrated in separate lengths. The point of rest on the string becomes a line of rest on the plate. When the plate on one side of a line is moving upwards in the course of its vibration, the plate on the other side is going down, and vice versa. As the plate vibrates, the dancing sand moves till it settles on these lines of rest. Each different sand pattern shows a different mode of vibration, corresponding to a different note given out by the plate. There are dozens of different notes which the same plate gives out when it vibrates in as many different ways. A little very light powder, like a podium, when scattered over the plate, is caught by the air whirls and tends to gather in heaps where the motion is greatest. Figure 71 Cladney's plates. The sand comes finally to rest on the nodal lines. The lycopodium is caught in the air whirls which form over the vibrating portions of the plate, and settles in little heaps when the sound dies down in the places where the motion has been greatest. When the plate is struck or bowed without any attempt to control the mode of vibration, the result is a jangle of all sorts of notes. These notes are not in tune with each other as were the overtones of a string or a pipe. We perceive readily when we hear the noise that there are many simple notes in it, 
whereas in the case of the string we had to use special devices to convince ourselves that there was more than the fundamental note we notice too that if we strike the plate in different places we excite sounds which are of different quality and again we are led to think that differences in quality are due simply to variety in composition some of the overtones of the plate being more strongly excited when we strike in one place and others when we strike in others a metal tray or a gong may serve to show this effect in the absence of a regular cloudney plate if we think further of all the different sorts of ways in which sound is made we find that practically every instrument we use gives us more than one note when it is sounded the string we have already examined the air column behaves very much like the string it has overtones like the string and when it is sounding some of the overtones are always there as well as the fundamental note if we take an organ pipe or even a penny whistle we get its fundamental note and little more but if we blow harder the octave comes in strongly as well and if we blow hard enough the fundamental drops out altogether the quality changes as the composition changes why the change depends on how hard we blow may be understood if we take into account the experiment with the air streaming past an obstacle a sheet of wind is directed by the mouth in the case of a flute by a channel in the case of a pipe or whistle against a sharp edge whirls tend to form alternately on each side of the edge the alternating motion tends to set up vibrations in the column of air in the pipe and these are generally as a matter of fact so strong that they take charge of the whole movement the period of vibration is set by the column of air not by the wind note still the latter has some influence when the pipe is blown harder and the wind note becomes higher in pitch the fundamental note of the pipe suddenly ceases and the octave becomes the principal note that is sounding it is found that the number and strength of the overtones that accompany the fundamental note depend on the shape of the organ pipe a wide pipe for instance has few of them and the quality of the note is dull the quality changes if the pipe is made conical instead of cylindrical and even differs according as to whether it is made of metal or wood in the course of centuries organ builders have learnt to give various shapes to organ pipes some of them very curious each shape conferring a certain quality on the note and constituting a particular stop some of the most interesting examples of the relation between quality and overtones are to be found in the reed instruments especially as they resemble the human organs of speech more closely than any other source of sound the reed goes far back into ancient times here is an example of a primitive form of instrument which is the ancestor of our clarinet and oboe it is made of bamboo and comes from luxor on the nile so far as its essential parts are concerned i suspect that the trappings may have come from birmingham at one end of the bamboo pipe is a hole which is covered by a thin slip of bamboo tied on at one end and free to move otherwise so that it can close down and shut the hole or as in the figure leave it partly open there is also a series of holes to be closed by the fingers as in a flute to play it one must put the end of it up to the point a in one's mouth and blow the air rushes through the opening as the figure shows and carries the slip with it until the hole is closed the flow stops the slip lifts the air current begins again and so the motion repeats itself the pace is set by the vibration of the air in the pipe the reed is so weakly hung that it obeys the vibrations of the air column and yet its motion is the cause of their existence the quality of the instrument is distinctly rich even to harshness much more so than that of the whistle or flute 
and the cause is that its overtones are very strong and in particular there are many overtones of high pitch that is because the reed shuts the hole very suddenly at the end of its stroke in the same way the gong which is struck by a heavily padded ball gives a duller note than if a hammer is used to strike a sharp and sudden blow there are also reeds in the concertina the harmonium and the mouth organ which however differ from the clarinet reed in one important respect they are made of metal and stand over a hole which they alternately open and close in much the same way but they are so strong that they vibrate at their own rate they themselves determine the pitch of the note and do not leave it to the vibrations of the air in a pipe in fact they need not have any pipes attached to them figure seventy four diagram of a metal reed r r this reed is strong and sets its own rate of vibrating it forms part of the apparatus seen on a small scale in figure seventy five figure seventy five reed to which different resonating pipes can be attached so as to give various qualities to the note metal reeds which themselves determine the rate at which they vibrate are used in the organ also and here pipes are often attached for the purpose of giving some distinct quality here is a reed of this kind which is blown from the organ bellows there is a series of pipes of different shapes which i can fit on to the reed in turn we notice the very marked differences in the quality and our explanation is that each different pipe encourages a different set of overtones while the fundamental note is not altered in pitch so we come finally to the most wonderful instrument of all the organ of the voice and especially the human voice in the throat is a reed the larynx which may be compared to the reed we have just been using and when we set our lips teeth and tongue into various positions we do something which corresponds to the placing of different shaped pipes over the reed by these changes and by subtle variations in the way in which we go from one set position to another we arrange for a running accompaniment of overtones which are the means of speech vowels and consonants of every shade of inflection and the infinite delicacy and variety of all the tones we produce is matched only by the wonderful delicacy of the ear which distinguishes them and the brain which interprets them we now possess these powers though long ago as the biologists tell us the origin of them lay in the detection of the changes of water pressure and of water movement by the rudimentary depressions in the heads of animals living under water there is yet one other wonderful power which the ears possess they can tell the direction from which a sound is coming we exercise it continually in the country we can listen for a moment and say the lark that is singing is in this or that direction in the war we became accustomed to the hum of the aeroplane and could quickly find out in what part of the sky it was flying now there is one very curious thing to be noted we have all of us i think the feeling that when a sound is to the right of us and we feel it to be in that direction we then hear it in the right ear only as a matter of fact it can be shown both by direct experiment and by theory based on other experiments that one ear is generally receiving nearly as much sound as the other much work has been spent in trying to find out how we exercise this faculty but the explanation is still very imperfect we have learnt however that it depends on the combined action of the two ears we speak now of the binaural or two-ear sense and that in some way or other the brain knows which ear gets a given sound pulse first that is probably true even if the pulse is one of a long succession of pulses all like one another 
it is certainly true if it is a single pulse or a well-marked effect or change in a continuous noise for instance in an experiment represented in the diagram the sound from the tuning fork is carried by the two pipes to the ears of a listener whose head is represented by the circle h when the two pipe lengths are equal the observer thinks the sound is neither to the right nor to the left of him but the tube a b and the tuning fork with it can be moved a few inches to right or left and at once the listener seems to hear the sound in one ear or in the other and describes it as being on the corresponding side yet there is no appreciable difference in the strength of the sound in his two ears figure seventy six experiment to show the binaural effect the tubing three quarters of an inch in diameter is eighteen feet by three or four feet i e about nine feet each side of the head the t piece about half an inch in diameter has a total slide of about two feet myers and wilson proceedings of the royal society volume eighty a page two six one moreover people who are deaf in one ear seem to find much difficulty in determining direction it is quite easy to test this property of the ears by blindfolding an observer and seating him on a chair on an open lawn someone else can then move noiselessly to different positions on the lawn and make various sounds we have now considered very briefly the main properties of the ear and will be able when we go on to the question of the use of sound in war to appreciate its difficulties and successes meanwhile there are one or two sounds connected with the sea which i have still to describe sometimes when we walk on the sand of the seashore we find it giving out curious sounds as it shifts under the pressure of our feet they are squeals more nearly than anything else these effects have been studied very carefully by mr currus wilson who has most kindly lent me for this lecture some very musical sand from the isle of egg in scotland it squeaks loudly if it is put into a cup of porcelain or hard wood and pounded with a hard pestle there is a distinct pitch to the note which alters if we change the pestle or the cup the note falling in pitch if a larger cup is taken or if the pestle is loaded with a weight there is no sound at all if the cup is made of rubber or if a rubber cover is put over the head of the pestle when the sand is examined under the microscope it is found to consist of grains more or less of the same size they are not quite round if a little dust or flour is mixed with the sand or if some of the sand is ground to powder by pounding the noise becomes feeble or stops the sand recovers its properties if the powder is washed out of it there is little doubt that the sound belongs to the stick and slip noises a pencil squeaking on a slate is a familiar sound which is caused by the pencil sticking and slipping quite regularly as it is pushed across the slate in fact if it is held lightly as it is pushed we can see a regular succession of dots a corkscrew and a cork stick and slip very rapidly with respect to each other and make a shrill squeak little toys which imitate the singing of a bird are made of a piece of soft metal turning in a wooden seat these work in the same way a bearing squeaks when it wants oil and the oil turns the jumping motion into a steady one in the case of the musical sand the grains pack and then the packing is broken at one or more layers and there is a shift to a new position of packing and sticking when the bow is drawn across the string of the violin there is an action of a similar kind but it is not absolutely clear that the bow and string stick and move at the same rate during any part of the vibration of the string it is not necessary that they should all that is wanted is that the bow should more nearly stick and be able to exert more force when bow and string are going the same way than when they are going in opposite ways 
in all these cases there must be something to set the pitch in the violin it is of course the string in the other cases probably one or other of the bodies rubbing over one another is vibrating at some natural rate when sound travels through water we always find that it is seriously interrupted if it meets with a mass of bubbles one effect of the sound bubbles is to absorb the sound energy this is very easily shown by tapping with a spoon or knife a tumbler containing beer or stout with a layer of foam on it the sound is absolutely dead quite different from the tinkling sound that the tumbler gives when empty or when partly filled with water the foam absorbs the energy of the vibrating glass it is to be remembered that air bubbles in water are like a crack in a bell no vibration such as sound can cross from one side to the other of the gap in the bell metal because the air cannot hand across the very great strains that come up to one side of the gap they must return that is to say they are reflected but the ringing of the bell cannot take place if the regular flow of sound waves in it is interfered with so the bell is mute in the same way the bubbles can be looked on as a partial crack interrupting the water partly but not completely the interruption is enough however to prevent sound waves crossing the barrier of bubbles if the latter are present in sufficient numbers the sound of a ship's screw does not pass very well through the bubbly water in the wake though still farther astern it appears to have got right round the obstacle lastly there is a beautiful application due to lord rayleigh of certain main principles of wave motion to the sound of the foghorn it is of course desirable that the sound of the horn should spread over the surface of the sea in a sheet but should not go up into the air or what is just as bad come down too much on the surface of the water near the horn and then be reflected upwards and go to waste figure seventy seven when the long axis of the funnel is horizontal the sound travels out in a vertical sheet and vice versa in one of our experiments with the tank we saw that waves spread quickly in all directions after passing through a narrow opening that is to say through an opening no wider or not so wide as the length of the wave there was actually better direction and the waves kept more within the bounds of a definite path when the opening was wider lord rayleigh therefore suggested that the foghorn should be fitted with a trumpet having an opening much wider one way than the other and that the wide way should be vertical the sound then spreads horizontally and goes over the sea in a flat sheet it is a little surprising that the wide end of the funnel should be up and down unless we think of what the tank experiment told us we can repeat lord rayleigh's experiment illustrating the effect the bird call is fitted with a funnel of the right shape and represents the foghorn the sensitive flame is actually outside the beam of sound which is sent out from the funnel when held with the long way of it horizontal and does not respond but when we turn the funnel through a right angle we see that the flame now answers and shows that the sound has reached it end of lecture five